So let me very briefly recap what we uh, discussed last time. So we started off by thinking about uh, choices under risk. How do people think about uh, economic behavior when things are uncertain, when there's risk involved? Um, I sort of discussed and showed you uh, sort of the main workers model um, uh, that economists use to study risk. That's sort of expected utility. That is um, a very commonly, extremely useful model for many situations. So it's like very widely used. If you ask like 100 economists randomly which model explains choices under risk, the majority will surely tell you expected utility is what you should use. It explains a wide range of phenomena in very useful ways. You can think about lots of different things. You can, for example, think about investment behavior, finance, when you think about uh, uh, what should you invest in, if things become uh, more risky, if assets are, are uh, more volatile, you need to have a higher return for that, uh, or need to be offered a higher return to, to invest in those assets, and so on and so forth. There's lots of useful um, applications in finance using expected utility. You can think of a range of different issues. You can think about, for example, criminal behavior, about sort of the risk of getting caught, what happens when the risk of caught uh, goes up, people uh, engage in less crime, and so on and so forth. Forth. There's lots of different behaviors that we can think about and explain using uh, expected utility. So what I, I do want you to sort of take away, like the, the expected utility model is a very useful model for various applications. What we're trying to do is trying to understand are there some applications for which perhaps uh, uh, the expected utility model uh, has some limitation, perhaps because of its simplicity or parsimony, because there's only one parameter in there. Can we sort of alter that in some ways? Uh, and try to make it uh, uh, more realistic in, uh, in some situations. So the key parameter uh, of interest when you try to sort of estimate this model, trying to sort of match the data in some ways, um, the parameter that you need to estimate here is you need to sort of assume some functional form. This is what I, uh, I did last time. Um, uh, I can show you this. Um, Assume this here. So one uh, very commonly a functional form is the CRA um, uh, utility function that's very widely used in a lot of range of settings. Uh, the feature of that is uh, it has like constant relative risk aversion, uh, and that has a bunch of like useful properties for estimating things or, or making predictions. So what you then need to do is if you try to sort of estimate somebody's risk preferences, how do people uh, uh, behave under risk? What you need to do then is sort of assume some functional form, for example, the CRA utility function, and then the question is kind of like how do we estimate uh, gamma, the risk aversion uh, parameter? That's the key parameter in this model. Now, how do you do that? Um, uh, uh, I showed you some uh, different choices that you get. Essentially, revealed preference. Economists believe in revealed preference. I give you some choices that involve risk. And depending on what you choose, that reveals what your gamma is. So you can do like uh, small scale gambles, which just is like small choices between different options. Some entail more risks than others. And then you can essentially just sort of uh, uh, estimate using those choices or people's certainty equivalent for such choices uh, what people's gamma is. Now, what we found is that when you have small scale gambles, people look or appear very risk averse. They're like often uh, decline gambles with uh, uh, positive expected um, value, uh, which makes them appear quite risk averse once you sort of uh, estimate this parameter gamma. Gamma looks like gamma is above 10, above 20, above 30, really, really high. Now, at the same time, you can look at large scale um, uh, risk. And there, when you look at large scale choices, um, when you sort of think about like what's a reasonable gamma, people actually only appear moderately risk averse. It doesn't look like they're particularly risk averse. Uh, we sort of think for those large scale uh, uh, choices, I mean, look at finance or housing or other applications, but people have estimated such models. Uh, you get like gammas that are between zero and two and uh, uh, roughly. Now, um, what that then applies is if your gamma is between zero and two, that means essentially. Uh, for small-scale gambles, uh, you should be essentially risk neutral. You should not care about really small risks that uh, are about a dollar or two. Um, so that sort of poses a problem because now we have like sort of two contradicting answers. We have like for small-scale uh, risk, it looks like people are really risk averse. For large-scale gambles, it looks like people are not so risk averse. Now we only have like one parameter is this gamma, which is coming from the concavity of the utility function. Uh, and when we only have one parameter and sort of two contradicting sort of pieces of evidence, we can't sort of match both, right? Because if you match 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 one of one, then essentially you can't match the other, and um, vice versa. Now, uh, I showed you a little bit um, Matthew Rabin's, uh, uh, what, what he calls the calibration theorem, which is essentially sort of calibrating, showing in a fairly compelling way that 
Um, in fact, uh, 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 you can formally show it's not about sort of assumptions of a specific utility function or the like. For very sort of um, minimal assumptions, which is just the utility function is weakly uh, 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 concave, um, uh, you can essentially show that like declining small scale gambles uh, with, high, with positive expected um, value implies that people are. Uh, 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 make absurd choices when the, when the gambles become larger. Uh, the recitation will discuss this a bit more in more detail and sort of going, walking you exactly and uh, in, in, in somewhat uh, slower speed through, through the specific example. Now then, uh, what we started then last time was thinking about uh, insurance choices. This is a very nice paper by uh, Justin Sidner. Um, and uh, one very nice feature uh, of this paper is that it involves real world choices. So it's not like some lab experiments with uh, uh, some experiments Experiments. Of course, some people care a lot about undergrads. Um, uh, some people might say, well, what are these undergrads choosing anyway? What does this have to do with real world choices? I think undergrads are great. Um, uh, uh, but you know, uh, one might wonder like, if you recruit people into some experiments and you see some choices, like, what are these choices really real? Like, do we really find uh, that these choices are predictive of real world behaviors? So, one answer to that is, well, let's find some data from the real world. Let's look at like, real choices that people have made in real world setting. And this is exactly what Sidner does. Um, so what he does is he has this data set of large uh, home uh, from a large home insurance provider. This is sort of 50,000 standard policies that are sort of like representative of what people choose um, overall. And the key uh, outcome of interest uh, in his study is like people's deductible choices. Uh, what's a deductible? Again, these are expenses paid out of pocket before the insurer uh, pays any expenses. So you have like a deductible of $500. You have a damage of like. Uh, 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 $200, you have to pay it all yourself. If you have a damage of $1,000, you pay the $500, and then the insurer pays uh, the rest. Right? And so uh, what he has is he has choices of a menu of four deductibles for each um, uh, uh, customer um, or client. So he can see both people's choice sets, and he can see people's preferred options. And that allows him to sort of say, well, if you preferred, if you have four options, you picked one of them, that means you preferred that one over the all three others. So we can sort of essentially uh, uh, put some bounds on people's um, risk aversion. And so we, we looked at this already. This is kind of what this roughly looks like. Um, there is different deductibles, which is essentially, again, like how much the insurance pays before, um, uh, so how much you have to pay yourself in case of a damage until the insurance payments kick in. You have the premium, which is like how much for sure do you have to pay every year. And then there is uh, the, the premium relative to the $1,000 policy. How much more expensive is it? Uh, that's in the third column. How much more expensive is it to choose a lower deductible relative to the $1,000 uh, premium? And then we have people's choices, which is, uh, in this case, I guess, uh, policyholder one chose a deductible of $250. Uh, it was a premium of $661, which is $157 more expensive than the $1,000 um, uh, uh, deductible option. Okay, and there's for each policy make uh, for each policy holder, uh, the company was in fact sort of providing individual uh, 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 prices. So essentially, they were looking at what is people's, uh, where do they live, what's the housing value, and so on and so forth. Uh, Sidner knows all of that. So he knows like the full set of options that people had available and their actual choices, and the options available vary by person. Okay. Now. Um, uh, how do we learn now about risk aversion? Well, so the losses to the customers are cap capped by the deductible, right? So if any loss you have from, the, from any damage that you get, the losses are uh, uh, only up to the deductible. So if you have a deductible of $500, the most you can lose is, uh, or have to pay in any case, and if any loss occurs, is $500. Right, so choosing a lower deductible, then what it does, it amounts to essentially reducing that loss in case you have a damage. So if you have a deductible of $500 uh, and decide to instead choose a deductible of $250, that means essentially in case there's a damage, in case um, you have to pay something, you don't have to pay $500, you have to only pay uh, $250. Uh, but of course, uh, if you lower your deductible, the price of your, uh, um, your insurance goes up, the premium goes up, and the premium you have to pay for sure. Okay, so the way you can think about this then is like, if you choose a lower deductible, for sure you have to pay more money. But you know, uh, in case there is some damage, you, you with some probability uh, uh, that happens, uh, if you have some claims, you have to like pay uh, less because your deductible is now lower. Okay. So now what info do we actually need? We need uh, the available deductibles, like essentially what are the deductibles for each choice. We need the premium for each option. Uh, we need the claim probabilities and people's wealth levels. 
right? Because you have a utility function uh, where there's wealth in there. I'll talk about this in one second. Any questions so far? So now, uh, one important uh, feature, and this I think was asked like last time about like, well, what about the claim rates? Well, the, the, if the claim rates are really high, or if people think the claim rates are really high, in some sense, then having very low deductibles makes a lot of sense because then you know, uh, if, and very often it happens that you have to pay. Then you know, you might actually not have a. You, it makes lots of sense to have like um, low deductibles. But it turns out claims rate are actually very uh, low. Here you can see um, overall, and this is like the full sample, this is everybody, people's claim rates is 4.2%. These are yearly claim rates. This is like out of 100 customers, 4.2 per year uh, actually claim any damage. Um, and then it, that varies a little bit by the, also by choice of deductible. So there's the people who chose who happened to choose in the end like $1,000, $500, $250, and $100. But for each of them, essentially, the claim rate is below uh, 5%. So it's very low. Okay. The second factor from his data is that reducing the deductible is very expensive. So for example, here's, um, uh, 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 this is the full sample again. On average, purchasing the insurance um, with a deductible of $1,000 costs $615. We can't say very much about that, because, about that choice because who knows how much the actual damages are and so on. In some sense, that's sort of irrelevant for us what that number is. What we're interested in is like, what are the differences across the different deductibles? How much do you have to pay to lower your deductible to like $500, $250, and so on? Now, what you see here is like on average, reducing the deductible from $1,000 to $500, which is sort of what this column shows that's um, uh, uh, shown in red, costs uh, uh, $99.91. You know, so that's, is that a, if you choose then like $500, is this a risk averse choice or not? Or how do we think about that? Suppose your claim rate is like, say, 5%. Yes? Well, I think it would be a risk averse decision because you're paying $100 more and your deductible has gone down by $500. So a claim rate for a back of the envelope calculation would, would need to be about 20%. Exactly. So what you're saying is um, you're reducing the deductible from $1,000 to $500. Uh, now, if you think that happens with a 5% chance, on average, you're going to get back, uh, uh, you're going to reduce your payments by $25, right? So it's 5% uh, times um, $100, uh, sorry, uh, uh, $500, which is uh, $25. Uh, but people are willing to pay about $100 for that. So for sure, they're paying $100. Uh, and the benefit that they get is with 5% chance, at least the average customer, with 5% chance, uh, they're going to pay uh, $500 um, less in case there's some damage. That looks already pretty risk averse, right? Because as one says, surely you're not risk neutral because then you would not do that. You would choose the $1,000. Uh, it looks fairly risk averse. Now, if you go down then, if you go to like from uh, $250 to $200, there's an additional $133.22. So that's to say, uh, reducing your deductible by another $150 from $250 to $100 makes you, for sure, you have to pay $133. And now if your chance is like 5% of getting like essentially a, a damage, that is for a 5% chance of like saving $150, people are willing to pay $133 for sure, okay? So now if you try to calibrate this, what we already know from this exact simple example is that people look extremely risk averse, okay? So that's kind of like the exercise that that um, um, uh, uh, that Sidner is doing, just as saying like, look, let's take these choices very seriously. Let's look at people have done in real world situation. These are repeat customers who have done this for a long time and so on. What are people choosing? And um, uh, if we sort of assume expected utility, uh, what would need people's gamma need to look like to be able to like, explain uh, uh, this data? And we can do this customer, this is like the average um, rates. We can do this sort of customer um, by customer. Now, what he then finds is people choose, the majority of people choose small deductibles. Lots of people choose um, uh, uh, $250, $500. Very few people choose $1,000, even among people, uh, and this is on the x-axis, who have been at the company for 15 plus years. 
right? You could say, like, the first time you do this, maybe you don't understand your claim rate, you don't understand what's going on, or whatever. But there's people who have been at this company for 15 years. Uh, you know, they should kind of know at some point that claim rates are pretty low, um, uh, at least on average. Um, uh, and so, like, if you have 15 years uh, at this company, it's hard to believe that you still think that um, uh, uh, your claim rate is, say, above 10% or the like, since it just hasn't happened um, very often. Okay. Um, now, how do we think about people choosing a deductible? Again, what you need is like uh, the following parameter. You need to have a yearly, the yearly premium, so you need to have the deductible D. Uh, you're assuming sort of no other risks to lifetime wealth, which is a bit of a distraction, but essentially you can't diversify risk and so on and so forth. Um, you could also, you can assume there's at most one risk per year. This is again sort of simplification and doesn't really matter very much for probability um, uh, uh, um, pi. And then, uh, for, for, for now at least, we assume accurate sort of subjective beliefs about the likelihood of a loss. Now, then, what is then the indirect utility function of wealth? What does sort of utility function look like depending on these parameters? Uh, can somebody explain this, what, what I'm showing here? What is this the equation? Yes? Um, the first part. Exactly. So for sure, so uh, with one uh, probability one minus pi, nothing happens. You have your wealth W that you had before. Um, you have to pay the premium for sure. So in that case, you also have to pay the premium. So you're going to end up with like W minus uh, P, the premium. And then with probability pi, you also have to pay the premium, which is you know a uh, uh, W minus P. But also you have to pay the deductible because some damage uh, occurred. All right, and then sort of your indirect utility, your expected utility uh, for that year is essentially then uh, the weighted average of these things. And uh, pi is essentially the, the weight on that, uh, which is the uh, uh, subjective, or in this case, assumed the actual probability of a damage occurring. Now, I sort of said, you know, uh, indirect utility function, uh, uh, utility of wealth function. What is that? Or what's A, what's an indirect utility function? And B, why is there wealth in it and not consumption? As like, you know, usually we think people eat stuff and, uh, 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 you know, there should be like consumption in here. Why do we have wealth in here? What, what is this? Yes? I think they might be like assuming uh, that for each level of wealth you are optimizing your consumption. Exactly, and, and what, what, what is the indirect utility function? Exactly, so usually you think like what you do is you are, uh, if you go back to like 1401 uh, notes or what, what was done in the first, I think, recitation, usually what you do is you uh, maximize consumption uh, with several goods or one goods or whatever over time, uh, and usually there's a budget constraint and wealth is usually in your budget constraint, right? You can only consume as much as how much money you have. It could be like your income or your wealth uh, if it's over your lifetime. Now, when you do that and maximize it, then you end up at an optimum. What you can then do is like, essentially express the optimum, uh, assuming that you have chosen optimally your consumption. As we're saying, you already chose whether you wanted apples or bananas or whatever. Um, uh, we assume that you optimize. I can then essentially just say, assuming that you're optimizing, uh, what is your optimized utility for different levels of wealth? And usually, it's a function of wealth and prices. Right? And that's what's the, uh, uh, the um, the indirect utility function is. Uh, we can very briefly also go over that in, in, in recitation. But if you go back to your um, uh, uh, 1401 uh, or other notes, you will see essentially that uh, it's the outcome of a maximization problem. Usually, it's like for two goods or whatever. Like it's it's like uh, income. In this case, it's wealth because it's like over. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's wealth, but it could be available income as well if you want it. Now, um, what is the person then going to do is like each contract has gives you uh, 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 an expected utility in terms of like how much do you expect your utility to be if you choose that specific contract. And now the maximization problem is now you choose the contract J that maximizes the expected utility uh, or the expected indirect utility uh, as a function of these parameters. Okay, any questions on this? <laughs> 
So we essentially, for each contract, we can write down what's the indirect utility uh, uh, function. Uh, it depends on people's wealth, so we have to make some assumption of how wealthy people are. And it depends on these other parameters. It depends on the premium. It depends on the uh, deductible. And it depends on the uh, subjective probability of uh, a claim occurring in that year. We assume that there's only one claim per year. OK. So now. Um, what we can do is then we can back out the implied risk aversion from people's choices. Um, uh, and in fact, what we can do is we can get upper and lower bounds on people's risk aversion from what they have chosen. Let me sort of give you an example um, for that. Suppose a person chooses uh, $100 uh, deductible. What does this mean? Well, this means essentially that he, he or she preferred the $100 deductibles over all the other deductibles that um, uh, were available. Right? So there's essentially, if you choose the 100, you get three inequalities. You get like the $100 deductible is better than the $250 deductible, $100 is better than $500 deductible, and $100 is better than $1,000 uh, deductibles. Now, this gives us a bound on people's risk aversion. Is it a lower or an upper bound? Or, and why? Yes? I think it's a lower bound because $100 premium is like the lowest you can go, and a lower premium buys, or sorry, a lower deductible and buys more risk aversion. So. Right. Exactly, sort of like a corner solution. So like, what if the person who chooses $100, that's the person that I just showed you previously. This is this example that I showed you here. Um, where was it? This is a person who looks extremely risk averse, right? This is person essentially is saying, like, I'm choosing the lowest possible deductible. I'm for sure paying quite a bit of money compared to all these other options, four or five percent chance of not having um, a, a, a damage. So this person will look very risk averse. Uh, it's the lowest possible option. So maybe the person, if they had been like a $50 or, or, or a $0 option, would have even chosen that option. We don't know because that's not available. But so what you can then do is, however, um, uh, you can just write down these inequalities. And so if, if you choose the $100 deductible compared to the $250 deductible, it will be the case that uh, if you sort of solve for gamma, this gives you uh, a lower bound for or gamma. So that's what, what does that mean? We know gamma is at least as high as, as you know, uh, 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 the solution of this inequality will tell us. But in fact, uh, their gamma could be even higher. We just don't know it because we don't have additional um, choices. Now, if you choose the $1,000 deductible, on the, on the other hand, you'll get like an upper bound. Uh, uh, and the, the reason is exact, exactly the same. It's essentially, if you choose the $1,000 deductible, that's like the riskiest option you can choose. Right, because you can essentially, you're choosing essentially something you, you will not choose not to reduce your risk in any way. So you're not willing to pay to do that. It's kind of like declining, essentially, uh, or, or accepting a gamble and not choosing the safe options. But we don't know whether this person would have chosen like uh, $1,000 in one deductible, or $2,000, or $5,000, what deductibles would have been chosen because there is no other higher options of deductibles. So now, um, and then in between, um, we have essentially lower and upper bounds because essentially we know that if you choose 500, we know that you didn't choose 1,000, and we know also that you didn't choose 250, so your gamma must be in between those options, whatever is implied by those two um, options. Um, there's a um, previous problem set that we posted that sort of walks you through that. Uh, we'll also go through that um, uh, uh, in recitation, sort of to, 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 to go through the mechanics um, of that. Any questions on this? Yes? I was wondering, uh, when your gamma is supposed to be higher than what, then you will be working with a negative exponential negative. Oh, but that's just, uh, you, you, I think the, so, that's not a problem because it's it's it just sort of flipped. Uh, so you have the gamma. Uh, it, that's why you have the gamma in the in the denominator as well. So you get a problem if your gamma is one because you're dividing by one. Then usually people use a, a log utility for that. Yeah. Extreme positions and not. Um, 
conversion? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, I'll get to this in a second. So um, what I have done right now, and this is the typical way of, like economists think about these things, is sort of say, let's take a model very seriously. Here's the model that I'm using to try to explain people's choices. Um, and now I'm essentially assuming everything else away. I'm choosing, I'm essentially assuming that the person optimizes, there's no mistakes, there's no framing effects, there's no other stuff going on, no liquidity constraints and so on. And now I'm taking this very seriously, I'm estimating gamma. Now the typical, and this is in section four of the paper, in fact, the typical thing then people that happens is other people are gonna say like, well, what about like, uh, people don't understand what they're doing? What about people misperceiving the risk? What about people um, uh, framing effects in terms of like the way you present um, the choices? People like to not choose extremes, but like to choose in the middle. Uh, can that explain um, uh, uh, the results? Um, there's some concerns about like that. I think one thing that your explanation, for example, would be able for, perhaps to explain is people choosing $500 over like 1,000. It's hard for, you, for the framing effects to explain why people are choosing 250. Right, so if you look at this um, uh, figure, in particular, the people who um, are in the company for 15 years, lots of people choose uh, uh, deductibles of 250. It's a little bit harder to explain with framing effects, why wouldn't you choose like 500 as opposed to 250. Uh, so the Sidner argues that's really not what's going on. I think at the end of the day, probably it's the case that people do not want these extremes. And to some degree, I think some of what's going on is perhaps at least contributed by some form of framing effect or so maybe marketing. You know, People sell the insurance uh, choices, really want people like they, they get more uh, paid, presumably, if they, they sell essentially these low deductibles because that's how the company makes a lot of money. Um, what Sittner says there is like, well, it's actually hard to sell people on stuff that they don't like. It seems like people really seem to, to want these things. And maybe some of that is sort of sales pressure, but probably not everything. Uh, so I think some of this going on, it's a little bit hard to, to rule out all of those things. Uh, but if you sort of read the paper, it's reasonable, uh, and since, since what I'm going to show you next is like the implied gamma is like so large that even if you sort of said, okay, half of this effect is driven by other things, you would get still like really absurdly large um, estimates of risk uh, aversion. But that's a great question. Yes. Um, well, uh, to some degree, in some sense, I think the, the way they sort of, so sorry, the question was like, is the company deliberately giving people choices that leads them to choose low deductibles? And this is therefore, do we sort of um, overestimate people's gamma? Uh, to some degree, yes, but it's not like just we have, you know, low deductibles available. There's a thousand dollar option available. I think there's maybe what you're alluding to is like there's some sales pressure and so on going on. That might well be true, and people sort of might, you know, emphasize risk and make it particularly salient and make customers nervous and say, like, look, these floods and so on are kind of going on, and really low deductibles are good. Uh, I think to some degree that's true, but you have to be pretty compelling in, 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 in your reasoning. Uh, one other uh, comment is like, there's lots of other example of people choosing low deductibles and sort of extended warranties and so on in lots of cases. For example, if you look at like iPhones or iPads and so on and so forth, um, uh, laptops, et cetera, lots of uh, Apple in particular, but other, other companies try to sort of sell uh, extended warranties that are, if you actually did this exact same uh, calculation, are not worth uh, engaging in or that reveal essentially extreme risk version among customers. Um, I myself, um, uh, looking at this kind of research, there's lots of research sort of argues that people shouldn't choose extended warranties. Of course, then I, I um, uh, uh, when I bought a laptop uh, uh, the last time, I was like, of course, I don't need extended warranties. And then, of course, uh, 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 soon after the laptop, um, you know, uh, 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 broken so on, and I didn't have warranty and so on. So of course, in specific examples, that may happen, uh, but on average, it's it's uh, it's not a good idea to to do. Okay. So now, um, what does then um, uh, uh, Sidner find? So now here in this table, you can see uh, the implied estimates of gamma. Remember what we said is what we think is a reasonable gamma is somewhere between zero and two for large scale choices. Um, he has different types of assumptions. He has like lower bounds and upper bounds of, of gammas. And what essentially you see is the gammas are like, depending what the assumptions are, in the hundreds or in the thousands. 
It depends a little bit what people's wealth is. So essentially, depending on how much you assume people, so what the data that he does not have is, what is people's wealth actually uh, uh, like? How much money do people actually have? So you make some reasonable assumptions for saying, like, look, these are people whose houses are like 200,000, 300,000, 400 dollars worth. So presumably, and we know from other data sets, so like how much roughly, how much money people have available. So then depending on essentially what utility function you assume, he is, all, he is mostly using like CRA utility uh, about like then as a wealth of like um, um, uh, a, a, a million dollars. You can look at like $100,000, $50,000, $5,000, and so on. You can also use CARA utility, which is constant absolute risk aversion, and so on. And essentially, what you have to assume is like extremely low levels of wealth, so about something like $5,000 to get into like sort of single digits or as, uh, uh, double digits of, of gamma. It's extremely hard to sort of uh, um, get estimates that are reasonable in a sense of like that we think are actually reasonable um, parameters of, of gamma. Any questions on this? Okay. So now, you know, why do people choose those small deductibles? And this is what, I, what you were saying before. So, so one um, uh, neoclassical explanation would be, well, they must be really, really risk averse. The gamma must be really high. Uh, there you might sort of say, well, uh, uh, you know, we know already that gamma shouldn't be that high from some other choices, so that's sort of hard to reconcile. Was there a question? No. Um, uh, second, you could say, well, there's really high uh, objective probability of claims. We know that the objective probability is only 4 or 5%. Uh, you'd have to sort of have probabilities of claims that are like 20, 30, 40% to be able to match these data. Now, it could be that people have risk misperception. It could be that people really think, you know, the probability is actually 20% when it's uh, at the end only 5 or 4. Now, what's sort of inconsistent with that is that like repeat customers, people who have been at the company for 10, 15, 20 years are making very similar choices. In some sense, you know, you, it's hard to reconcile that everybody is misperceiving this risk uh, year after year after year and spending lots of money. Um, there's some questions on, is it borrowing constraint? Is it like people just don't have enough money? Um, uh, are they worried about, um, about having to pay um, uh, uh, these deductibles? That also seems quite unlikely because, in fact, the deductibles are not particularly, it's not like about, we're talk, not talking about like $5,000. People could sort of, if they really face these borrowing constraints, they could save and so on. So uh, 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 Sidner also argues that that's not going on. There's some questions about marketing, social pressure, and so on, which is like, of course, the company has very much like incentives to sell people these kinds of deductibles. Um, I think some of that is probably going on, and it's hard to rule out entirely. Uh, again, like it's hard to actually sell people stuff that they don't really want to. Um, so you know, there must be lots of social pressure to, to, to in fact, do that. Menu effects already talked about a little bit. Uh, uh, there, you know, we think that. Um, maybe menu effects can explain why people choose 250, uh, sorry, 500, or like the interior choices, why they don't choose 1,000. It's hard to explain with menu effects why people choose 250 over um, 500. Now, so then uh, Sidner's preferred explanation is then reference-dependent preferences and loss aversion, which we're going to talk about um, next. Yes? Um, is there any data on whether like, the probability of a claim is um, correlated with which menu option people chose? Like, yes. There is. Um, so you have, a, uh, you have it here. So uh, it's sort of weakly correlated in a sense like if you choose uh, or weakly negatively correlated. So the people who choose $1,000 have 2.5% uh, uh, um, uh, claim rates. And uh, the, the, uh, you know, the $100 at 4.7. So that's kind of not quite explaining things um, either. Yeah. Just to add to that, I think they use a plus one regression to control for the fact that those with lower deductibles make claims multiple times. I see, yes. Uh, great, yes. Um, so, so what do we learn from this? I think sort of, uh, I think this is very much sort of confirming some of the lab evidence data on like relatively small-scale gambles. These are not like small-scale gambles of like a dollar or two or five or ten. These are about like you know several hundreds of dollars, but they're not about like you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you know these are relatively small relative to like people's lifetime wealth. And what we see for those kinds of choices is really looks like people are 
Uh, people are very, um, uh, appear to be very, very um, uh, 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 risk averse. This is what I was saying already previously. When looking at sort of reasonably small scale choices, and I count sort of the Sidner evidence as reasonably small scale choices because it's not about like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you essentially see that people, um, uh, such choices imply sort of, as uh, so A, you see people seem very risk averse. These choices uh, um, imply enormous risk aversion for large scale risks. Um, but you know, people are not avoiding all sorts of large scale risks. People take on lots of large scale risks, so in some sense that can't be true in some ways. Um, we also find that individuals are moderately risk averse for large scale risks. People are taking on some risk, as I said. Now, if you sort of take that seriously and say, well, people might not be that risk averse, that is, uh, in turn uh, implies that people are nearly risk neutral. They should be nearly risk neutral for small scale risk. So it can't be that both of these things are true at the same time. Now, um, in fact, there's a much older paper, and that's a very famous and seminal paper um, uh, by Kahneman and Tversky. Kahneman got the Nobel Prize, um, um, uh, uh, in fact, for, for this work and similar uh, work. Uh, importantly, um, uh, or Kahneman is a psychologist, and they were doing psychology ex experiments, and it just turned out that these psychology, psychology experiments were extremely influential in uh, affecting how economists think about risk and risk, uh, uh, risk preferences, and particular sort of risk preference dependent uh, preferences. And so, uh, what Kahneman and Tversky were doing at the time, way before a lot of this other literature that I just showed you, um, A, they showed even more sort of evidence against the expected utility model. Um, but perhaps more importantly, they also proposed an alternative model and saying, like, look, here's some choices that we think are not really making, uh, are like hard to explain and hard to rationalize using expected utility. Now, here's a different model that can explain things um, um, uh, 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 perhaps better in some situations. Um, so what did Kahneman Tversky actually do? The experiments are actually extremely simple in various ways. They're very clever and very clean, um, but actually very simple. And so what did these experiments look like? These are survey responses. Like essentially they just ask people about what would you do in different situations. This is not what economists were doing at the time. Economists at the time were like saying like, revealed preferences are important. I need like to make you, uh, make you to do actual choices. Uh, whatever you say in surveys doesn't matter because you know, who knows what you, uh, whether you actually mean what you say. It turns out that the survey responses are actually, these are hypothetical stakes, but it turns out that if you do this with actual stakes, you find very similar uh, results. Um, and the uh, experiments were uh, uh, as follows. There were things like questions like, which of the following uh, would you prefer? Kind of like I showed you in the first um, uh, class at the end, um, uh, the, the survey that you did. Uh, would you prefer option A, which is a 50% of uh, winning $1,000 or 50% chance of winning nothing, versus option B is like $450 um, for sure. And so there's a series of these types of questions. Now, one of the things that then they showed is a one key prediction of expected utility is that uh, as I said before, people only care about final uh, outcomes uh, and their associated probabilities. Um, Kahneman and Korsky show a bunch of different striking uh, contradictions of that. I want you to focus on the first row, problem three and problem three prime, and look at that and sort of tell me uh, wh wh what of that um, uh, example is uh, contradicting expected utility. Uh, if you can see this. So I, let me just read this for you if it's, it's hard to see, but like to think of this for a second. Problem three says, um, uh, uh, would you uh, prefer uh, an 80% chance of $4,000 over uh, $3,000 for sure? What you see below then, these are always um, 100 people. You see the number of people who preferred one option over the other. So 80 people um, preferred the 3,000 option. Uh, 20 people said, I'd rather have the 80% chance of uh, $4,000. That's problem three. Problem three prime is um, about what they call negative prospects. Uh, would you prefer um, uh, an 80% chance of losing $4,000 or for sure losing uh, $3,000? Okay, and there you see 92% uh, 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 choose the first option and 80% uh, choose the $3,000 loss uh, for sure. Let's start with this, the, the, the left example. What do we learn from the left example? Are people risk averse, risk neutral, risk loving, or what, what do we learn from that? Risk averse. Risk averse, and, and why is that? Um, if you calculate the expected monetary 
So we said before, somebody is risk neutral if uh, the person is indifferent between two options when they have the same expected monetary value, right? And so in this case, an 80% chance of $4,000 is $3,200 in expectation, right? And, um, but there's a bunch of people who say, I'd rather get the $3,000, which is less than $3,200, for sure. Which means essentially they take a sure, like an option that's for sure um, um, uh, they get. They prefer that over the uncertainty of getting zero versus 4,000, which on average gets them more 3,200. Uh, expected utility would say, if you choose that option, it must be that you are um, risk averse. Okay. Now, uh, not everybody seems risk averse. Uh, there's 80 people out of 100 uh, uh, choose that, or 80, I think it's 80% uh, choose that. Um, and the remaining ones um, choose the other option. This person, uh, the other people could be, we, we don't know much about, they're not very risk averse, but they could be also risk averse, just like it wasn't revealed in their choice there. Okay, so from the left side, we say we know at least 80 people or 80% of the, the, the sample is risk averse. Now let's look at the right side. What do you see on the right side? Yes? Uh, well, they seem to be risk low because uh, unexpected is minus 3,200 and uh, versus minus 3,000, but they prefer the minus 3,200 on expectation. Right. So now it looks like, so if you look at the left option, uh, it's minus 3,200. Uh, so the left option has more risk, and it also has a lower expected monetary value. As you said, uh, the expected monetary value, it's just a flip uh, of, of the uh, uh, problem three. It's minus 3,200, um, and the other one is minus 3,000. So if you're nivorous neutral, surely you would choose the minus 3,000. If instead you choose the minus 3,200, well, it must be that you really appreciate that there's additional risk there, so it looks like you're um, risk-loving, okay? And now we find here that 92% uh, of the sample choose um, the first option, um, but at the same time, the same people, when they're uh, 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 you know, offered um, uh, or given the choice in problem three, 80% of people choose um, the other option. So there are a bunch of people who essentially choose the $3,000 for sure in problem three, at the same time, they choose the minus 4,000 with an 80% chance when, not, when, when given a problem three prime. So that means essentially we have two choices here. One choice says people are um, risk averse. The other choice says people are risk loving. In expected utility uh, terms or world, this cannot happen. The reason being that we have one parameter, which is gamma. Gamma tells us how risk averse or how risk loving or whether you're risk neutral or like. That parameter tells us everything about your risk preferences for all choices that I'm giving you. It cannot be that you're simultaneously risk loving and risk averse. So this evidence essentially is sort of rejecting uh, 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 the expected utility model or cannot explain this behavior. Does this make sense? I sort of wrote this down here, but I think uh, I said everything that's to be said. Any questions on this? So then, um, so where we're going to go is essentially, A, this people seem to be behaving differently for gains versus losses. And in addition to that, so not only do people seem to dislike losses, we'll I'll show you some evidence of that, um, but in addition, people seem to be risk-loving for losses and uh, risk-averse for gains. And that's kind of what, what kind of money first we are claiming. And once you make that claim, you'll be able to uh, explain this, uh, uh, these patterns in the data. Now, a second thing that they show is um, the following. They show a problem 11 and problem 12. I'll let you read these in, in, uh, uh, for yourself. Um, and essentially, you see that 84%, so the choice here is uh, starting in addition to whatever you have, for sure you're going to be given $1,000 or uh, shekels, I guess. Um, you are now asked to choose between 1,000 with a 50% chance and 500 for sure. Okay, 84% say option B. Problem two is, in addition to whatever your own, you have been given 2,000. Uh, you are now asked to choose between option C, which is minus 1,000 with 50% uh, chance, and option D, which is minus 500. And 69% uh, uh, of people here say um, uh, they choose option uh, C. Okay? So what's the problem with this? <laughs> 
Yes? I mean, at the end of it, like, um, you would still end up, like, problem 11, option, you end up with, like, 1,500, whereas um, problem 12, like, option B, you still end up with 1,500, and yet you're, like, inconsistent with these decisions based on how the question is. Exactly. So framing matters, uh, or reference to points matter. Um, and so what assumption of the expected utility model is that rejecting? That it's just the end state Exactly. So we, we, uh, um, we postulated that only final outcomes matter. Uh, uh, here, um, if you write this down, it turns out option A and option C are exactly the same in terms of like final outcomes. It turns out option B and D are also exactly the same. I'll let you look at this for a second. Um, uh, uh, so A and C are the same in terms of the final outcomes. B and C are, uh, sorry, B and D are also exactly the same in terms of final outcomes. So that means essentially when you compare A versus B and C versus D, if you only cared about final outcomes, you cannot choose different things here in this uh, lottery. It cannot be that your utility is defined over just final outcomes because you just told me you like two different things for the exact same thing. Right? And there's 84% of choose option B, while 69% choose option C. So there's a bunch of people who essentially switch. Is that clear? So now, um, uh, what is that sort of what's going on here? Well, we, what we're going to go is like, well, it seems like so exactly as you say, framing matters, how you frame the problem matters. But why does it matter? Well, it's because we're setting like a reference point. In the first place, uh, in the first example, the reference point is like 1,000. And there is like a gain relative to 1,000. We look at like people evaluate this gamble as like gains. In the second example, the references point is set to like 2,000. And now people essentially evaluate this gamble as losses relative to the 2,000. And sort of depending on how people think about gains versus losses, it turns out then people make different uh, choices. Well, I'll, I'll be more formal about this, but that's essentially the idea of like, why can Kahneman and Tversky, their prospect theory, what they uh, uh, propose, why can that explain these behaviors uh, as opposed to expected um, utility? OK. So now, uh, what are sort of the most important points? Uh, there's uh, three of them. I'm going to show you two, and then get to the third one um, uh, uh, at the end. So one is like what matters a lot uh, for people's behaviors is changes rather than levels. So what they argue is utility is not defined by people's final states, how much, did, how much do they end up with, but as opposed to like how much does um, uh, uh, changes relative to some uh, reference point. That could be changes relative to like a status quo. How much do I have right now? Um, and how much does it change positively or negatively? Or it could be relative to some expectation or some other reference point. What I showed you here in this example is like, this is not the status quo that people evaluate their utility against because the outcome is always the same. The reference point here is kind of like the expectation. I set you and say, OK, here's 1,000. And now uh, what seems to be happening is that people's expectations, in fact, become uh, 1,000. And then relative to that expectation, people are going to evaluate gains and losses. Um, um, uh, and similarly, if I give you, like, say, you get 2,000, again, people are evaluate the utility uh, or their, their, the outcomes uh, as gains and losses relative to that. Uh, second, there seems to be a loss aversion. People, um, uh, losses loom larger than gains. That is to say, people dislike a loss that's as large as a, a gain uh, by a lot more than they like the gain. OK? So it's like people, if you say you lose 100 versus you gain 100, people really dislike losing 100 a lot more than they like gaining uh, uh, 100. And once you sort of postulate that, well, then I can explain why you reject a bunch of gambles. Because if, say, like if a gamble is like minus 10 with 50% chance and uh, plus 11 with 50% chance, well, you're gonna, if you dislike the losses a lot more, if you dislike losing $10 a lot more than uh, uh, gaining 10 or $11, well, then you're going to like this. Uh, uh, reject this um, gamble, even if the expected uh, value is is uh, uh, a positive. Okay. Well, we'll write down sort of like a utility function next time that sort of uh, uh, does this more formally. But essentially, those are the two two key ideas. There's a third one, which I'm going to get to in a second. Now. The key part here is like there is essentially reference dependence. People evaluate um, uh, their outcomes relative to some reference point. What kinds of examples do we actually have of reference point? When you look in the world, and again, that's kind of very much what I'd like you to do, when you think about things that you see in the world, 
what kinds of examples do we have that people care about reference points um, uh, as opposed to final outcomes? So exactly, when you think about pricing of different options, it matters a lot to people. It seems that when you uh, add five cents versus subtract five cents or 10 cents or whatever, uh, the same changes about like it's just, it's five cents at the end of the day that you have to pay more uh, uh, or, or, or less depending on whether you use a back. Your choice of using a back versus not should not be affected by uh, whether it's framed or, or put as like a loss versus a gain or like a, you know, whatever, a rebate or whatever that you might get. Uh -huh. And I think that's true for many different, that's for, true for shopping uh, 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 plastic bags of the like or any other shopping bags. Um, but it's also true for many other options. It depends a lot whether you sort of add on that option or whether you get sort of essentially subtracted the option uh, as sort of some discount. Yes? Um, this makes me think of like Black Friday sales where stores um, can mark stuff up before the sale and then you drop it back down with a discount. But right. Right. I think some of this is not exactly, I, I think there's some legal constraints to, to the, the, that specific behavior because it kind of, you're not supposed to sort of trick people, but surely some of that is going on. Um, people love discounts. Like, they love making good deals. Uh, they love sort of getting things cheaper in various ways compared to some reference point. And the reference point, since it's hard to tell what actually should the price be, is often like the previous price. There's something that seems really expensive, and now they're getting it um, uh, uh, for less money. And sort of if you get it for half the price, even if it's still quite expensive, you think like you saved half of the price uh, 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 somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah? How do you feel about what you have may depend on what you see your neighbor having? Right. So reference points could not just be uh, prices or like uh, sort of things that like affect yourself in certain ways, and then price is the key example overall. The reference point could just be your environment, your social environment. We kind of talk about this to some degree also when we talk about social preferences. Kind of people care a lot about what others do, and their reference point might very much be formed by what their neighbors do, like how big is their house, how big is their car, uh, do they have a swimming pool or not. It could be also like your neighbors, like how good are they at school, how smart are they and so on, how good looking and so on and so forth. So when people evaluate certain outcomes, they often don't evaluate the levels, but rather kind of how much another person uh, uh, makes or whatever other people's outcomes are. And part of the reason might be that like evaluating absolute outcomes is really hard. It's very hard to actually understand is $10,000, $50,000, $100,000, a million, how much money do you actually need to be to be happy or that, that that you like or how much what kinds of outcomes are you excited about and so on but it's much easier to say you have something and another person does not or the other way around it's much easier to compare with others it's very hard to actually evaluate absolute outcomes because who knows you know what the app like how how you should feel about um, that much easier to say I have this they don't or the other way around yeah um, people sometimes don't want to let go of Right, so that's uh, exactly, that's called what people call the disposition effect. Uh, there's actually pretty large literature uh, studying this and lots of debates on whether it's really going on or not, how important it is, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but sort of one very basic stylized fact is that when people are looking at stocks that they might uh, want to sell, they are much more likely to sell winners compared to losers. Now, why is that bad, or like, well, should you not do that, or? Um, is that because the winners are the ones that are more likely to keep the money, while the losers are the ones that Right, there's a bit of a question kind of is there like momentum or reversal or the like. 
But if you believe in efficient markets, which you know many economists do, uh, or at least some of them uh, uh, who, who are in Chicago, um, so um, uh, if you believe in efficient markets, then um, uh, the current stock price should essentially um, not be, or like the previous losses and so on, should not be informative of what's going on in the future. So in expectations, your losers and your winners, if there's any information uh, about the future, about the future valuation, that should already be incorporated in the price. So if you look at two stocks, one lost some money, one gained some money, uh, they're equally likely to, 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 to make you money. Um, and so if anything, what they show in the, these papers is like there's momentum, this is what you're saying, is that the winners actually are, in fact, going to be more likely to, to, to increase value compared to the losers. But people tend to essentially um, want to sort of realize gains. People seem to be happy about making gains. They seem to be very reluctant to uh, 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 sell um, the losers. And there's some questions on like how costly is that actually, but that's a very robust pattern uh, in the data. The same is also true, I'm going to show you um, on Monday, the same is also true for houses. People are much less likely to sell their house um, uh, uh, when it has lost value compared to when it gained value. And you know, controlling for a bunch of things. Yeah? Yeah, so that's a little tricky. There might be other things going on, but it, exactly. It could just be that like, if you don't go to a movie um, when you have bought a ticket yourself, it's sort of perceived as a loss and you really don't like that. It's a little complicated how to think about this in simple terms because in some sense the loss is still there. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, exactly. It's like you, you sort of lost money. It's almost like as if you lost the movie ticket and didn't get then sort of some value uh, from it. There's a bit of a question whether you sort of integrate these two things or not because people think about monetary terms versus other things often in separation. But I think some of that is exactly people feel like uh, they have a loss if they uh, don't take advantage of their movie tickets. So I'm going to show you some examples that are actually much more uh, basic in some ways. Uh, uh, when you think about like visual illusions. There's what's called like the size contrast illusion. So one of those things is like when you look at circles or things that's supposed to look the same, uh, that in fact are the same size, they look quite different. Depending on what you contrast things with, things look quite different. For example, if you look at these circles that are in the middle, they're in fact exactly the same size, but in fact they don't really look like that. Similarly, if you look at these two circles, it's perhaps more stark. These circles are in fact exactly the same size that are in the middle. Every time I'm teaching this class, I'm sort of like have to convince myself that they are actually the same size. So I kind of like print it out and sort of measure and to be sure that's actually the same size, and they are, I checked. Um, uh, but it's very, when you see this, even if you know it's an illusion, it's very hard to convince yourself that it's not. Um, but they are the same size. Um, when you look at these bars, when you look at the upper black bar and the lower black bar, again, it seems like somehow the upper one is like wider, but in fact it's not. And again, it's about the contrast to, to the uh, other side. There's this one which throws me off the most. There's like when you look at um, uh, uh, fields A and B, they are uh, the same color. That's hard to believe once you see it. Uh, they are actually the same color. And again, I, I would print it out and actually put them next to each other. They are the exact same color. I checked. Uh, there's also a video that you can watch that sort of shows this. Um, uh, uh, and exactly what's, what's happening is the way we perceive colors is coming from uh, 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 contrast. Right? So like black does not, or gray does not look as gray when uh, white or darker gray is next to it. Um, this is um, uh, uh, similarly here, if you look at the, the, the gray of this bar, this is the exact same gray. Again, you can print it out and sort of look at it, it's the exact same. When you look at it, it just does look like on the right side it's darker than on the left. Um, now, there's plenty of examples of reference dependence for vision. Uh, there's tons of them, they're kind of um, uh, quite interesting. At some level, it tells us something about the brain. Like in some ways, we can learn about like essentially the way we um, evaluate certain outcomes overall is essentially it's much easier for us, or we think about in contrast. It's very hard for us often to think about uh, levels. But of course, that's vision. So like in some sense, what do we learn really about utility? Um, one thing you can look at is. Um, uh, bronze and silver medal winners at the Olympics, presumably or arguably winning a silver, me silver medal is sort of better than a bronze medal winner. If you look at these two um, uh, women, one of them won the silver medal, um, uh, one of uh, them won, uh, won bronze. So what people have done, or psychologists have done, is like took actually a bunch of pictures from like ceremonies uh, of, of bronze and silver winners and just looked at like who looks happier. And when you do that, um, essentially um, uh, uh, the bronze medalists look on average happier than the silver medalists. Presumably, it's because you know uh, they just missed gold, while the other person uh, uh, sort of won bronze because they, you know it's great to be third as opposed to uh, fourth. Um, 
And there's more. Uh, you can read more about this, but but that's sort of like one uh, uh, finding. Now, it, it's true for lots of different uh, 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 feelings, perceptions, judgment, and so on. Uh, people compare um, uh, stimuli in various ways when it comes to temperature, when it comes to all sorts of things, uh, relative to reference levels. It's very hard for them to evaluate it in absolute um, uh, uh, terms. So it's easy to say, you know, when you look at like water, it's very hard to say what's the temperature, even if you sort of practice this a lot. It's very easy to say um, one bucket of water is warmer than another. It's very hard to sort of say it's like 70 uh, degrees or 60 or whatever. Uh, it's very hard to sort of understand what absolute temperature are. And I think that's the same in some ways for uh, a lot of uh, um, um uh, a lot of consumption or other decisions, it's very hard to say how much should you pay for this or how happy should I be with certain outcomes because people need some reference and often then the reference are either some expectations or their neighbors or just comparing between different um, options. Um, so, you know, that's the example I mentioned previously, which is, you know, it's much easier to compare your income or any outcomes, your grades, et cetera, compared to what your friend has. Um, it's much harder to say um, how much an extra uh, $1,000 or having like $50,000 per year, is that good or bad? Uh, it depends a lot um, uh, uh, what you compare it um, uh, against. Um, so what people tend to do, and this is exactly what Kahneman and Tversky were um, uh, postulating, is that people compare the outcomes relative to um, reference points. So, um, and again, uh, we're going to write this down in more um, detail at the beginning of next class. But what Kahneman and uh, Tversky were postulating were essentially two things. Uh, they're postulating, A, there's a reference level of consumption or any outcomes. We're going to talk a little bit about like, what actually is this reference level or where it's coming from. For, us, for now, we just assume there's a reference level that people consume, uh, uh, compare the outcomes against. And then there is, um, uh, against that, uh, outcomes are, are compared. And in particular, um, uh, uh, the function is like steeper on the left compared to the right. Right? Essentially, um, losses are um, loom larger than gains. So like going uh, a down by uh, a 10 units on the left or one unit on the left is more painful than uh, uh, you know, going up on the right relative to that reference uh, points. Okay? And so that's uh, we all said. You know, so then you know, what evidence or experimental evidence uh, uh, do we, in fact, um, have for that? So one. Um, example, so we have sort of experimental evidence of this, and I'm going to show you next time a bunch of different examples of like real-world choices, uh, starting uh, from golfing to selling houses to lots of other outcomes. But sort of the experimental evidence that uh, the earlier experimental evidence that people showed were uh, preferences over risky gambles. I showed you some of those already. Uh, and then in particular, unwillingness to trade different options uh, uh, compared to like an alternative option that I showed. That's what people refer to as the endowment effect. So let me show you first the gambles. We already had that. In some sense, these are like essentially gambles. People seem really, really risk averse uh, when, they, when, when they are uh, offered these gambles. Kahneman and Tversky would say people are essentially loss averse. People really dislike the loss of $10 um, uh, relative to the gain of $11. And we can explain that behavior. And that's a very robust finding that people decline these types of, types of gambles. Kahneman and Tversky would say uh, that's evidence of loss aversion. Now, you might say these are really small gambles. Really, do we really care about them? Well, once you do this, so like with $500, $550, or whatever, larger amounts, people also do the same. It's hard to do this with like real world money because it's quite a bit of money. And turns out there's actually some studies who do that as well. They did this like for real um, with MBA students, financial analysts, and rich investors. And even those uh, people like uh, uh, tend to then um, uh, turn down those kinds of gambles. So there seems to be quite a bit of evidence of loss aversion when people are um, uh, uh, given the choices between gains and losses, people seem to really dislike uh, losses. Now, what's the endowment effect? That's sort of the, the perhaps most famous um, evidence uh, uh, in this domain is essentially is people, when uh, are endowed with a certain item, they really do not like to trade. And so the way you would do that is um, you, uh, an experiment, we give people an item. And then you ask them essentially, and it's a randomly, uh, 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 random selected fraction of people are, are um, given an item. And then either people are offered the choice, would you either keep your item or would you get another item? That's sort of the same value overall. Or what people do is like they uh, uh, have some experiments. There's many of these experiments. Uh, you, you, you give some people uh, one item and uh, some other people another item, and then see would you like to trade uh, with each other. And what you see essentially, very people are extremely reluctant um, to trade. There's many of these kinds of examples. Like for example, um, uh, uh, 
Yeah, so, so one example is, sorry, I, sh I skipped that, which is one example is like if you just give people an item, usually it's like a mug. If you give people a mug and ask like, how much uh, do I have to pay you to give me, uh, to, 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 to sell me this mug? Okay, people say large amounts, they would say like $5. If instead you ask them, here's a mug, would you like to purchase this mug, and sort of controlling for um, uh, how much money they have and so on, if you ask them, like, would you like to buy this mug, people would say, like, $2 or something. It's the same mug, and you know, essentially their choice depends on whether you give them the mug versus uh, uh, whether you endow them with the, the mug, which is where the endowment effect name comes from, or whether you just sort of like ask their willingness to pay when they don't have it. And there's tons of different experiments that uh, do exactly that. Now, a different version of that is like, so this one is about like uh, buying a mug or selling a mug, buying and selling prices. Different versions of that is to say uh, you have like uh, a population of students or different people, um, and what you do is essentially you find two items that on average have the same valuation. Right, and Knitsch was doing that. And um, so he had like mugs and pens, and he sort of calibrated such that on average people, when you just ask people, people's willingness to pay for these mugs and pens are like on average roughly the same. Of course, there's variation, but on average it's the same. And then you offered half the students mugs and half the students pens, and then offered an exchange. He also offered an exchange for um, uh, uh, an addition of five cents and saying like, okay, maybe you're just exactly indifferent, so I'm giving you five cents in case you exchange. And it turns out that the mug people like to keep their mugs and the pen people like to keep their pens, uh, and 90% of people uh, do that. That's one of the most robust findings um, um, in, um, in experimental economics, uh, there's some questions on like expectations. Do people expect to keep the mugs and so on and so forth? There's some complications for that, but the basic result is very uh, robust and has been shown in many different um, settings. Any questions on this? So what's going on here? Well, essentially, um, uh, the reference point seems to be essentially uh, affected by ownership. So if you own a mug, your reference point is owning a mug. So now, if I ask you, would you like me to sell me this mug? Well, now you have a loss of a mug. So essentially, you're in the lost domain of mugs, so I have to pay you more money to compensate you for that. If in contrast, you do not own a mug, so like you have zero mugs, your reference point is zero mugs, I'm asking you like, would you like to receive a mug um, or like buy a mug from me, then essentially you're on the gain domain um, and sort of the, what I showed you here previously, one second. So when I'm asking you to purchase your mug, essentially you're on the left side of this uh, uh, figure, you're on the loss domain, your marginal utility of mugs is very high, I have to pay you a lot of money uh, to receive the mug from you. In contrast, if you have zero mugs, I'm asking you, would you like to purchase a mug? You're on the right side of the reference points. So essentially now you're in the gain domain, and now if I, uh, uh, you're not willing to pay a lot of money uh, because um, uh, you're gaining a mug. On top of that, you're also on the gain loss of domain of, of money, but like I'm setting that sort of like uh, aside. Does that make any sense, or? Okay. So, Right, and so people uh, hate losses more than they like to gain, so they stick with the mug. And similarly, that's the same thing for the uh, uh, pen owners. Um, there's lots of different examples of those kinds of um, uh, behaviors. For example, law, law school students were asked to assess compensation for pain and uh, uh, suffering damages in one study. Uh, this is uh, expected to last, or this in this example, is expected to last three years uh, and be quite unpleasant. Uh, there's no earnings impact on earnings capacity. For example, it would be extreme stiffness in the upper um, back and neck. I think that would probably affect your earnings capacity, but, but anyway, uh, let's assume that's not um, the case. Um, so then some students are led to imagine they were being injured. How much would you be um, uh, willing to pay to get better? Okay, so your reference point is like you're injured. How much are you willing to pay um, to get better? Um, and people said uh, 151,448 on average. Um, now, another group of students was led, and this is randomized, is led to imagine being uninjured. Like, how much are you willing to pay? Uh, uh, would I need to pay you to accept the injury, right? You're not um, injured, now I'm asking you, like, how much are you willing to pay, um, or how much you have to pay you, how much you have to compensate you to accept, uh, accept this injury. Now, you would think this is like the same thing, because, you know, uh, uh, you, but what's your price of not being injured? Uh, the price of health should be independent on, like, which way I'm asking you. Turns out when people are, um, have their good health, they're willing to pay a lot more uh, 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 to keep it or to not lose it compared to like when they've lost it, um, uh, when they're gonna regain it. 
Um, there's another um, uh, a quite nice example I'm showing you um, uh, uh, here. One second. So that was, um, in case you didn't see, that was uh, Dan Ariely, um, who has a, a very nice or several nice books. One of them is uh, Predictably Irrational, which is a quite nice uh, 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 read. Um, so there's lots of these kinds of examples of um, um, loss, um, uh, loss aversion, or what's called the endowment effect, when people have stuff, essentially, um, uh, they're not willing to part it. When they don't have it, they're willing to pay uh, less. Um, one nice thing that uh, Ariel was also talking about a little bit about how people then explain these kinds of behaviors. We're going to get back to that um, and I think, lecture 20 or something, which is about kind of like, I think what's going on here is very obvious. Potentially, people are loss averse, and they're randomized into like gains or losses, and that's kind of what's explaining their behavior. But people don't necessarily understand understand that, that they're being randomized in one or the other condition. And they then sort of try to explain their behavior in various ways and saying, I want to tell my grandchildren about this. Uh, but in some sense, they're sort of like rationalizing their preferences. And they don't necessarily sort of understand with these stories. And they don't necessarily understand where these preferences are coming from, even though we kind of know because the person has been like manipulated into those kinds of uh, choices. We'll get back to that. Now, the third part of um, Kahneman and Tversky's um, uh, prospect theory of their paper is essentially what's called diminishing uh, sensitivity. I'm going to get back to this and sort of write this down in more detail um, uh, on Monday. But essentially, it's like um, uh, people are risk averse um, in the gain domain, but risk loving in the loss uh, uh, region. What does this look like? Essentially, um, uh, the utility function is a little bit different um, from what I showed you before. It's not only like more steep on the left relative to the reference point compared to the right, but it's also uh, concave on the right and convex on the left. Okay, and what that gets you and what that buys you essentially is that people are uh, uh, risk averse in the, in, the, in the gain domain, but people are uh, risk loving in the loss domain. And that sort of is needed to be able to explain some of the behaviors that I showed you uh, uh, early on in the Kahneman and Tversky uh, evidence. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about these, um, uh, this in more detail and sort of write this down um, um, more precisely. Um, and then we're going to talk about like many different applications. In particular, sort of there's the endowment effect, which is kind of what I talked to already about before. There's labor supply, um, employment, and effort, depending on what people expect, how much they earn. Uh, they, um, um, uh, uh, they make different choices about how many uh, uh, hours they actually work, depending on the expectation, whether it's above or below a reference point. People are reluctant to sell their houses if they're at a loss compared to a gain, even for very similar houses. Uh, in marathon running, people are trying to reach essentially certain uh, uh, targets. People like to be above, below four hours or three hours in the lake. Um, there's the disposition effect that you mentioned, which essentially is people like to sell um, uh, winners compared to, 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 to losers. And there's the insurance choice that I already showed you before. There's some evidence on uh, 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 violence in the household, um, uh, uh, the particular example example is about um, uh, football or, or games, essentially. I think football games were essentially depending on whether people expected a loss or win of their team. And when they actually lost or, uh, 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 a loss or win of the team that actually happens, there's more violence when there are unexpected losses compared to expected losses, which is again uh, uh, consistent with um, um, loss aversion. Um, what's next? So next, we're going to talk about many applications of reference dependence on Monday. Uh, I'd like you to sort of read the, the Kahneman and Tversky um, uh, paper, at least the first uh, pages, sort of, so to get some sense of their work. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we're going to start talking about social preferences. In particular, we're going to have some experiments in class. There's going to be uh, no, um, uh, no readings for that. There's your opportunity to make money uh, in class, at least some of it.